everyone, Ryan and Mark here. Welcome to the Barbecue and Brew Show. Today, we've got a very, very special guest, uh, the Texan-based Aussie, uh, Live Fire Cooks, coming on the show. She's an author. She started Hardcore Carnivore. She's the co-founder of the Australasian Barbecue Alliance. Uh, what hasn't she done? Uh, and obviously, she's a meat nerd and, and loves a meat science. So I can't wait to get Jess Pryles on and having a chat. But before we get going, Mark, how are you doing? And uh, doing are, you, well. are you pumped today? Oh, this is going to be amazing. Like, this is probably someone with a lot of knowledge. Again, I, I learned so much just from watching your videos and the education. So it's not just the, you know, how to cook your meat, but it's education behind it as well. And and the stuff she's done with the earth in the science area, for me, I love that. Yeah, mate. Cannot wait. Cannot wait. And obviously, live from Texas too, which is kind of our first international guest. But again, we've got an Aussie international guest, which is quite... Uh, We've done, so again. Again. We've done it again. We've done it again. So good. Uh, mate, uh, we've got a quick shout out to our sponsors, obviously, the, the Rub Society.com.au, who uh, who sort of look after the help, help us run the shop and um, or the store, uh, show rather. Uh, yeah. What's your Rub of the Week, mate? Uh, I'm just going to go this. Um, it's called Black. It's pretty good. Uh, I've oh, right. it on oh, a lot of steaks and a lot of brisket. Never heard of so it. I've never just, heard of it. That's interesting. Never heard of it. If you haven't tried it, do yourself a favor. Go and get yourself Black. <laughs> I know I usually do firecracker but this is my second <laughs> that's all right mate look i did some steak with those and uh they're next level what i love about them is you don't need a lot like it's just a little so sprinkling shannon in. Uh, walker got me onto it so he's like get up single steak put it on one side cook it flip it done and i'm like yeah, yeah. unreal mate uh i'm gonna go with uh, you may have probably heard of this one too but yeah it's just uh the hardcore kind hey, of red. you just copied uh, me i went black you've gone red no nah. <laughs> well we couldn't get the same one when's Pop the first one oh, mate out. Now, this one here, what I like about this one, I put it yep. on some chicken the other day, uh, did a quick sort of smoke up in the GMG, uh, and the kids ate it, and Susan ate it, uh, which, yeah, which like never that. happens for my barbecue, <laughs> right? So that's a, that's a winner for me. So, uh, yeah, High Cook Pine for Red, both available at ripesociety.com.au, uh, RFTRS, I've got to look at that code every time, uh, for 10% discount at checkout. Uh, and obviously, our other uh, sponsor is Brewery Colo down here in Ocean Grove. Uh, I'm drinking the Ocean Grove Lager. Keeping, uh, it's a, it's a nice, palm morning mate. for me. It feels uh, like what time is it? Ten oh two. Let's crack it. All right, here we go. Um, cheers, cheers, buddy. Uh, all right, without further ado, um, let's get Jess Pryles on and see what uh, what she's drinking to start with, and go from there. Hey, Jess, how you doing? Hi, how are you guys? Good, thanks. Good, good. Thanks, thanks for uh, coming on to me. <laughs> <laughs> more you know what this could be uh this could get a little uh, addictive i think i was telling mark offline just uh i can see why people like uh the morning drinks it's good but uh what are you drinking today uh i am drinking the national beer of texas lone star beer <laughs> because, Excellent. i don't know if you knew this but texas used to be a republic so right yeah so cheers yeah cheers <laughs> It's cool. It's uh yeah, first international guest. So great to um uh have you on. I feel like Sorry. international domestic. Yeah, I know. It's uh it's 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 kind of the same, 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 but different. Uh I like it. Um all righty. So look, uh before we get going, lots to get through. And uh Mark and I sort of sat down, like, what are we gonna ask Jess first? Because there's heaps to go through. And I think the most important question that everyone's asking about is how many squirrels have you got in your backyard? And um, uh what are their names? I've been feeding them all day long today because <laughs> they're getting ready for winter and they're coming to the door now and just kind of standing there like this. <laughs> <laughs> like, you You've domesticated them. I like it. <laughs> Haven't named them, but yeah, I've got to name them. I definitely don't need them. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And look, it's uh, I, I don't know what it is. I, I, I sort of grew up with squirrels uh, back in Sri Lanka myself, so I sort of miss having them in. In Australia, and possums don't quite cut it, um, but yeah, it's it's cool seeing your little videos. You do that, but let's let's take it back. Uh, and I know you've sort of shared your story a couple of times, so we'll uh, we will sort of go through a little bit quicker this time. But um, fifteen years ago, first trip to the US, you tried barbecue. When we went back to Australia, and you're like, "What did you find?" And you know what? Obviously, that sparked your journey. But tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was, you know. I don't need to explain to Aussies because they understand we're a well-traveled group, right? Yeah. And so I was traveling on on uh, <clears throat> through the States, stopped in Austin just because I had some friends of friends here. So I sort of had a, a good point of reference and I'd heard it was yeah. a pretty cool city. 
And even back then, like the thing you did was eat barbecue in Texas. It's just the thing that tourists do. And I just remember having the first taste of it and I thought, oh, my God. I mean, everything that's turned it into just a phenomenon, you know, back in Australia as well. And I had that moment. And I came back to to Australia and over the next few years, I kept going back to Texas twofold. One was because I was really falling in love also with Texas at the same time and the culture and everything about it. And I had great friends over here. And um, I was also getting more curious about barbecue. So I was learning more like you had access to pit. I mean, you still have access to pit masters, but I would be like, Hey, do you mind if I like watch what you're doing and ask about it? Cause it wasn't quite as crazy then as it is now. Yeah. Yeah. And I came back home and at the time, I mean, literally like a handful of people in Australia were doing low and slow cooking. I mean, I specifically remember all from Silver Creek smokers. Yeah. was about One of the only ones, Adam Rothwell, was one of the very, very first people in Australia who was doing it. Um, and, you know, just a couple of others as well. Um, and it was just like this cool little club, like we knew this secret that no one yeah. else knew. And now everyone knows, but it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I love about it. And, um, you know, even going, I mean, going back just 10 years for Mark and I, we were just, you know, we were dabbling in the worst barbecue uh in, in the world in especially when it comes to ribs because we that was the way everything started for us was like going and having barbecue ribs and what we thought was barbecue ribs which was actually uh just boiled ribs at uh at a local restaurant so it's come a long way and it's yeah, really it's great has a lot to answer for <laughs> <laughs> they still do that's the worst thing they should know better now um <laughs> Look, we all ate at TGI Fridays back in the day, all right? No, well, yeah, well, oh, well, I actually haven't never been to TGI Fridays, but definitely been to Hogs They're Breath and regret it every time. You're not missing out. Yeah, well, Hogs Breath actually closed down in Geelong, so I'm quite. Uh, it's a, it's a good day for Geelong, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, so, I mean, you know, I guess after that, you know, you're in Texas now, and and, and you've been there since 2015. Yep. Um, how's that been? And you know, what was it like adjusting? And I suppose coming in, uh, especially with, you know, with being Australian, having an Australian accent and things like that, what was that all like? So it's, um, I love it over here. It's definitely, I feel like I have two homes because I sometimes say I'm going home when I'm going to Australia, but also I'm coming home when I'm coming to Texas. So I yeah. have two homes. Um, you know, it, it wasn't hard to adjust at all. I'd spent so much time traveling here, but that by the time I moved to Austin, like I had a huge, great diverse group of friends i knew exactly where i wanted to live in the city i was super familiar with it so that part was easy and then everything else comes easy too you know learn to hunt i i like i had to buy a gun safe this year i've accrued so many <laughs> i've really settled in um you know i'm driving a truck all that kind of stuff the it married the texan um like i killed all those myself and butchered them oh so cool so i'm pointing to skulls if you're listening to the podcast but, <laughs> um, but uh the accent was an interesting thing so two things happened one is as i started to sort of build a career over here you get pushed in different directions and at one point i was working with a production company and they're the people who try and pitch you for tv shows and they had said, this was very early on, they were like, you need to hide your Australian accent. Yeah, right. Um, and so I kind of did that for a very short amount of time, and that's why you still see some videos with a very full American accent. But I will say that mostly I do have a natural, non-forced hybrid accent because you learn to change your language to just be understood. And Rayan, you yeah. get this coming from another country as well. 100%, like, yeah. I could say water at a, at a restaurant and sit there and repeat myself nine times, or I could say I'll have some water and get it yeah. the first time. So you end up just helping yourself out by making it yeah. easy for yourself. And you also talk back what you hear too. Yeah. So, um, my husband has learned now to speak full Australian, so oh, sweet. <laughs> that's helpful. And that's also, I think, why my Australian accents actually come back more in the last year than it 
than in the last seven years. It's crazy because I don't have to work as hard to be understood, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. I think that's, um, and you hit the nail on the head too. It's not necessarily you're trying to like be like somebody. You actually just want to, like you said, help yourself out. Um, but I find I I tend to, um, I don't know what it is. It's just sort of built into me where I tend to get into like a mode of like, if someone's speaking to me like in an Irish accent, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm speaking to them about half an hour, 45 minutes, all of a sudden, I'm picking up accents and I'm yeah. throwing it back at them. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not, trying, I'm not trying to, mock, I'm not mocking you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, let's keep moving on. But yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, that's great. And look, I think it's really cool to see the your videos. And yeah, you sort of, you go between the two and then you call out your accent. You go, no, this is how I say it. This is how, yeah, get over it. Yeah, the steak tartare thing was just. Yeah, the tartare, that's the one. <laughs> oh my God. That, like, that was the core. Co- that single thing was the cause of the most viral video I've ever had on YouTube. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> because, and even then, I just heard myself say YouTube instead of YouTube. That's, that's natural to me now, right? Mm. Like, I say trash now, not rubbish for example yeah. anyway i'm we could do a whole so i've started to do this how to speak australian series on tiktok <laughs> yeah, i love it, love I'll, it. I'll take it back to barbecue jess <laughs> thank you so, so, so look you know people tell me you know austin's the you know the capital of texas and also texas is the capital of best barbecue in the world where would i get a really good brisket in austin texas i mean you could just throw a dart really um, <laughs> that's the thing everyone's like how often do you cook brisket i'm like never because i don't have to yeah. <laughs> it's amazing uh in locally interstellar Leroy and lewis um whitfields style switch micklewaite franklin yeah Justin, all of the above <laughs> like there's and, and then there's always new places popping up that you get to try. And we're talking like the creme de la creme brisket. Like, I, I mean, your listeners would know a lot of them have maybe even done barbecue pilgrimages. These are just local restaurants to me, <laughs> which is nice. I can see why you've stayed there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's uh, oh my, and that's thing. And I think uh, Mark and I were watching Barbie Barbie Quest. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correct, but uh, Barbie Quest with Kelsey Prebilski. Um and that was um, like amazing. A few four, I mean, four episodes, but jam packed with just amazing barbecue. Uh, what was that like to film? And and on, on top of that, like it was filmed so well. Mark and I were talking the other day, going like, just the the you know the transition scenes and the video is just done so well. It uh, was that how good how good is it to be part of that? It was really epic. It's, a, I mean, it was a full TV production. Um, yeah. And it's on Hulu here in the States. Um, and yeah, you, you, you guys can find a way to watch it. Uh, it was it was awesome. It was awesome because I know so many of those people now. Like, I know John Bates from Interstellar and Leonard from Truth and, you know, so many of the joints we went to. But it was really cool this season because they actually went to the producers as well. So we went to a feedlot and we went yeah, to yeah. the and it was really cool because I've met so many amazing people in agriculture. Um, and, you know, in Australia, I know a lot of them have started barbecue joints or barbecue competitions, like people who work at feedlots or meat companies, things like that. So there's a really cool connection there as well. And to make um, to tell that story, to make sure everyone understands that there are so many people who go into doing the work to even get the brisket to you before you get a chance to screw it up. <laughs> uh, and and I think um, it, it was the feedlot, especially the one where, you know, talked about how the, the, the barley from the beer would be fed to the cows and the cow would be then, the steak from the cow is, is served at, the, at the, the brewery for lunch. It's just like this great story. But the one that resonated with me through the most was the the creativity, uh, the creativity and innovation episode. That um, just seeing the barbie, barbecue evolution, seeing I guess seeing where Australia is now, and then seeing that sort of okay, how how is the other cultures coming into it and bringing the flavors in? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, locally we've got uh, you know Wildcraft Barbecue, who's a, is a local barbecue joint here, and uh, yeah, basically he brings his Filipino heritage into the barbecue, and he fe- his his meat trays include things from the Philippines, which is amazing. So it was really cool to see that it's sort of happening so much over there. And it's almost like seeing Australia in five years or 10 years time. Like, okay, we can see where we're heading. It's so good. We're seeing a lot of 
I mean, the obvious one is a lot of Tex-Mex fusion. So you've got yeah. Hurtado and, and Panther City and Valentina's and they're doing things like smoked brisket tallow tortillas or elotes, which is like a corn dish. Um, but using these kind of Mexican Tex-Mex dishes and putting a barbecue spin. And we are starting to see there's a huge Vietnamese community in Houston, um, yeah. which is where Blood Brothers is, um, yeah. Koi Barbecue. So we're starting to see a lot of Southeast Asian influences as well because that makes a lot of sense. Even Leroy and Lewis use, um, do a, a kimchi um, with some of their barbecue, like in one of their barbecue sandwiches, just because, again, if you think about it from a culinary perspective, like that hot and sour and vinegar mm -hmm. is, is, is the same concept as a Carolina vinegar sauce, you know, just yeah. in a different way. So... Um, I think that there's a lot of room, especially given how multicultural Australia is, to have a lot yeah. of different interesting fusions. 100%. And that's um, that's kind of been something I was driving me because it's just trying to find different ways of cooking barbecue ribs and different flavors because you can only put the same sweet barbecue sauce and the same sweet rubs onto, uh, onto ribs. For sure. Yeah, can you tell I mean, just ask about Adam here? Roberts. He can put pistachios on it and blow up the world. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's it. So can you tell us a little bit about the uh, World Butcher Challenge? You know, how, how great was it? And Aussies, we, we came nearly first. We came second. We did pretty well. It was um, so good. It was just... <laughs> so that was the biggest test of my fandom slash allegiance since I emigrated because I knew everyone on the US team. I knew yeah. everyone on the Australian team. <laughs> <laughs> the Canadian team, the Brazilian team, yeah. people on the Italian team. But everyone, I'm like, I'm, I'm Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm part of the event. I can't pick sides. <laughs> and, no. But it was just like you walked into, it was literally a stadium. Yeah. walk into a stadium and they've got these massive hanging frames that have a side of beef, a side of pork, a whole uh, a whole lamb and five chickens just like yeah. hanging there. And to watch them do that in non-refrigerated um, conditions, because that makes it even harder, obviously, to butcher meat like that. They've been training yeah. for two, three years because of, yeah. of COVID. Um, it was epic. And... It was kind of personally special for me because my cookbook, Hardcore Carnivore, um, all the meat, <laughs> all the meat in that book is from <laughs> Peter Boucher's in Melbourne. Yeah, cool. I love that book in Australia, yeah. and Tom Boucher, who's you know Peter's son, who's still a butcher, and Peter was actually a judge at WBC, was there, and he got named to the All Star uh, World Team, and I've been friends oh, with. Cool years you know since working on before the book and to get to be there and and see someone who you know he's such a good mate go through such an incredible moment it's it's safe to say by the end of the night i was fully you know like all right go australia <laughs> <laughs> it was it was so good to see the aussie team building up to it too obviously um you know i met a few of them at meatstock uh mark and i did a couple of interviews with them as well which is great and then just seeing you know shannon walker taking on the manager hat he was real serious for once which was uh which is different for shannon uh and then just the team coming together and even the even the junior team the uh the apprentices that just you know i think they, one of the guys came first as well in in the apprentice side of things so it's just it was really cool and it's good and uh, what i'm loving seeing is i guess the the love and 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 that sort of uh, attention the butchers are getting, you know, I felt like we, we lost that for quite a couple of decades and, you know, they became sort of the back of house, but now the butchers have really come back to the front of the house, which is great to, uh, great to see. It's, it's great to see their stories. Yeah. And it's, you, you know, it happened just because of like a lot of industries, the craft was nearly lost because the product yeah. got automated by just boxes of vacuum sealed product being shipped out. So end users didn't need to know what they were doing, but um, I wanted to give a shout out, especially to, to Jay Beaumont with Meatstock and Butcher Wars, because yeah. I think that he is like significantly responsible for the resurgence of kind of butchers being rock stars in Australia. Um, yeah. It was his idea, it was his concept, and he's managed to elevate it. And the cool thing is, it's the butchers themselves that are the real rock stars. You know, they yeah, do, um, yeah. 
Paul Suleiman, Luke Layson, who was the Australian team yep. captain. Uh, there's some incredible, incredible people. And that's me. So <laughs> <laughs> that's mum calling from Australia. So yeah. <laughs> I you on the internet. Play that up. <laughs> <laughs> now, look. Um, and yeah, look, I must admit, and seeing Butcher Wars live a few times uh, earlier this year, and, and experience our first meat stock as well. We sort of we're relatively new in the uh, in sort of the scene, so just seeing meat stock for the first time, especially after a couple of years of being offline, um, is incredible. And and yeah, like you said, the Butcher War I have not seen. Like you, so you've got this main stage of meat stock. If anyone hasn't been to meat stock, the main stage of meat stock becomes the the Butcher Wars stage. Yeah. Uh, but like you know, you sort of see the stages. The crowd got to grow up and down during the day, but during the Butcher Wars, it is packed. Like packed like even in especially in Toowoomba it was like oh, the seats were full and it was like well. six people deep standing watching this show and you can barely walk past it was so good I believe that yeah so so fascinating. Well. Like, I didn't realize how exciting that would be to watch and to sit there mm. and go wow what these guys can do is amazing and how fast they do it which is it's more scary because I'm waiting for someone to cut themselves, but <laughs> yeah <laughs> so well quick. and you know I think especially at barbecue competitions you know the the public never gets a chance to interact with the teams. It's hidden. The judging is done, you know, in a, in a private yeah. area. And even then, most of the boxes look the same, you know, because you're going for yeah. that. With Butcher Wars, you never know what you're going to see at the end. Mm. Of it. Same with World Butcher Challenge. Yeah, those display tables are bloody amazing. Like, just epic. Epic amount of meat prepared perfectly. So good. And, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for taking us on this journey, too. Like, we watched a lot of your stories and, and just seeing – seeing how uh, it travel because you don't get to we don't get to see some of those things as, as easily as we uh we can um when we're down here so that's great but look want to kick on to i suppose hardcore carnival sorry for the uh quick transition as uh uh, uh now <laughs> now look again amazing name um i think I've, I've spoken to a few people over the last couple of years and they're all going like god damn it that that name's just amazing and just there, you've nailed the name, Sahako Carnival, which obviously I, I've listened to a couple of your podcasts and things like people people think you're all about the carnivore diet. Diet, so we'll just we can we'll tick that off that it's not. Uh, but tell us how it started, and, and you know what um, you know what were the first few rubs, and obviously we've got the red and the black with us here at the moment. But what uh, what kicked it off for you? Um, I, you know, at that stage, I was already, I'd moved to the states. I was living in the states. I had a small merch shop with t-shirts like you know, steak and bourbon, a, a, a perfect pairing, um, a complete meal actually is what it said. And just a few bits and pieces to sort of augment my website and my social media presence. And this is before, I mean, it, if you don't know any better, you would probably assume that the seasoning landscape has always been like this, but it really is literally just the past four years that it's exploded in Australia. Oh, yeah. yeah. So prior to that, there, there were no Australian brands particularly, um, maybe one or two, um, not for barbecue, just for general meat seasoning. But I had an idea of like, okay, I share my recipes with people and I'm, I don't have any plans to open a restaurant, so how can I make them taste what I think a steak should taste like? And I found a yeah. co-packer or a manufacturer who would do a minimum that was, you know, it was achievable. And I thought, oh, I've just got to give it a crack. And I had seen um, people use activated charcoal in other things. It was a big thing in like health foods and shakes and stuff like that. And, I, and because my journey is that I went from someone who didn't know how to cook meat at all, really, to someone who now teaches other people how to do it, one of the bigger pain points for people is also getting a really great sear. And often they yeah. can overcook their meat while they try and get that great crust. And that was my experience. So I thought, well, what if we can add the activated charcoal to it and give it this really great vivid appearance? And I kind of came up with that idea for the black rub and put it out there and it went off. So much so that it was the first one out of it. For whoever's listening, I'm going to go on record. If there's any black rub that you have bought, Hardcore Carnival came out before it. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Um, so we kind of made it popular. But um, And I like to think that anyone can put activated charcoal in a rub, but not everyone can make it taste good. So uh, we that's what I came out with, and I didn't have plans to have a seasoning company. 
it was just like, and I, I was in, <laughs> was sitting in a pub in Port Macquarie with Jay and Adam and on one of my visits home and we'd done um, the, the Port, Port Mac um, festival that Jay yep. would do. And Jay's like, you know, you've got a brand, right? Like you have to keep bringing stuff out now. It's like, oh. <laughs> and so red came out just because a lot of people love the flavor of black, but black really does not look good on pork ribs. It's suited to red meat. It looks amazing with that red black contrast, but for yeah. white meat, it kind of just makes it look burnt. Although yeah, I know yeah. there are lots of people who like to use it on chicken. So yeah. red is nearly an identical flavor profile with a tiny bit more heat to black. So that's when that came out. And then everything after that, then we've got Amplify, which is like umami powder. Yeah. Then we came out with Camo for Wild Game and Lamb, uh, Michelada, which is our chili lime. And it was really fun to explore all the different chili powders over here. Then we came out with uh, Fried Turkey, which is our seasonal one, which just came out again. So oh, Michelada, sweet. Fried Turkey, Tex-Mex, Jalapeno Salt, Sweet Rub, and ugh, yeah. I got it here. We just released. Oh, uh, you got some. Oops, that's flaring. Yeah. Oh, that's and that's what I'm 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 so excited for that one. Um and you know we sort of spoke offline on that one too just the fact that it was good it, you know it's not just a barbecue sauce it, it's pitched right at that burnt end side of things which ends up being having to put a whole bunch of different things to make the burnt end sauce whereas you're like just pour it on top and you're done. <laughs> well, you guys will you I promise it's on its way there. You will eventually get a chance to taste it. It's also about the texture and the thickness. And also yeah. some barbecue sauces are not designed to be reheated. And I think you may oh, right. have there experience, go. you know, food is chemistry. So um, in the same way as we sort of get obsessed at like brisket binders and the ingredients that you can add to it and what they do, um, if you use a certain type of barbecue sauce that uses the wrong sugars, it'll split during cooking if you try and reheat it. And that's when you end up instead of that, you know, it might have poured on nice and shiny and glossy, but it ends yeah. up looking kind of matte and dull and quite dry at the end. And yeah, it's yeah. that those sugars weren't designed to be reheated to those temperatures. There you go. Obviously yeah. heat changes um, molecular, molecular structures. Yeah. So it was about the shine, the gloss, the flavor, the thickness as an all-in-one. Um, so that you're also never sitting there trying to like constantly reduce, reduce, like, oh, it's not thick enough. Crap. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Reduce, reduce. So they they all have purpose. Well, I'm finally look, done we, before we... I take it off and start eating it, you know. I do. <laughs> <laughs> now I I'm I'll, I'll be I'll admit I uh, it's sort of in the name but I sort of keen to see how those burn, that burnt end sauce goes on some ribs at the end so I'll uh, that'll be the first thing I'll be trying is basically glazing some ribs up and 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 using the red and some burnt end sauce I reckon it'll so yeah just watching That's the videos like, I I prefer it with the red because it's so sweet so yeah the um, heat comes in. And so I've done it on ribs. It's great. I've done it on yeah, nice. chicken wings. It's great. But the big one, which is going to be there in time for Chrissy, is ham glaze. Ooh. Ooh, I so that. if you want to double smoke your ham, so basically you're just reheating your ham in the smoker. Yep. Um, you can reheat it there with a sort of pop your ham in a, in a, um, in a, a, I was about to say aluminum. <laughs> rack. You can get lots of different um, sort of flavor liquids at the bottom. So you could use orange juice or you could put water with some cinnamon sticks or some star anise or some orange peel, you know, to, to really get that fragrance going. Cover it in foil. So you're basically reheating it in the steam bath. So it's going to be really, really nice and moist. Um, and then take it off, let it get in some smoke for an hour after that to get all the way up to heat. And then you would just pour that burnt end sauce over the top and really just glaze the shit out of it. <laughs> yeah, okay. That sounds like something I have to buy by the box. Um, uh, <laughs> and look, I, I, it's just um, it's just exciting to sort of see, I guess, yeah, that, that sort of your journey through, like, you know, obviously different rubs and things like that, but now the sauces are coming out because then that opens up another whole level for you which is looking forward to seeing how that goes and uh uh now and then in the middle of all that you you, you wrote a book which i sort of uh showed before uh i've got all mine uh ready to go from what i want to cook up uh great book by the way 
it's um what I like about it is like I don't know what it is, but it's almost like a, a great handbook for the the person wanting to like if you if you want to get into barbecue, like that's a good book to start with. Because you kind of you go through the barbecues, you go through the cuts, and then you give them some recipes. Um, the one thing I'm keen to try is the PB and J wings. Those look those look next level. Uh, peanut butter and jelly wings for people uh, who maybe not know that acronym, uh, which sounds. Mark's like, oh, that's just. Why are you putting sounds... jelly on it? On the <laughs> Man, you gotta try, it, dude. You gotta try. It. Um, not that kind of jelly. That's what I mean. Why are you putting jelly? Damn. <laughs> Damn. It's not, it's not airplane oh, jelly, dude. Damn. It's oh, not airplane jelly. Oh man, God, you gotta you gotta get used to the Americanisms, mate. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, yeah, the, the book. You know, the, how long do you take to write that? I mean, uh, silly question, but obviously that it takes a while to do. But you know, what it seems like it's pitched at, at, at the at that sort of person that just wants to get in there, cook some stuff, learn about barbecue, and it it, it hits the nail on the head. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's a silly question at all. I mean, first, I, I, I guess I'd say it's it's a meat lover's cookbook, not necessarily a yeah. cookbook. Um, yeah, I like that. There's yeah. all sorts of techniques in there, but we do talk about grills and smokers and things like that. I don't know why we said we. It was literally just me alone who wrote the book. But <laughs> this is how much I have to catch myself in interviews now because I'm like, oh, someone's going to like Someone it. else is writing it. <laughs> um, I like it. And are you break you break you break up the barbecue stuff, right? Which I love. You're like, yeah. Yeah. You know, and so just little things fun. like that, that kind of go like, yeah, this book's for me. Like, this is the one that I go, this is a good one. Cool. And that was, I mean, that got written in 2016. So it's been a little while as oh, well. Wow. There you um, go. It's just, it's still in print, which is pretty neat. But um, yeah. I, I, it takes, it took me about three months to not just write it because I started to have ideas for the recipes, but the biggest thing is there's two things. One, you have to make sure these recipes work. So you have to test them over and over. Yeah. Again. I had to test them. I was living in America with an Australian publisher, so I had to test them in the US and then convert quantities, yeah. um, which was a little <laughs> bit of a challenge. And then I flew back to shoot the book in Australia, so that was like, oh, I couldn't use anything so it's actually a great book for Australians because I couldn't use anything that I knew I wasn't going to be able to find in Australia, like, you know, exotic chilies or yeah. you know, really rare Mexican ingredients or anything like that or Velveeta or whatever. So it's a very functional book for Australians as well. Um, the hardest part was having an editor, like writing a cookbook is super weird because I'd be like, here are the ingredients because I've been writing recipes for my website for ages. And I'm like, da -da, two cloves of garlic. And she's like, do you mean garlic, comma, peeled? I'm like, yeah, obviously. She's like, no, you have to write it because otherwise. Two cloves of garlic. <laughs> oh, so I was just get emails from, like, people who were like. Oh, yeah, right. Soup was too papery. It's crazy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. Yeah, that's. Uh... Yeah, you can't, you can't, you gotta, you gotta get it down to the finite level, which is, which is interesting. And, and I suppose it, it, you know, you sort of share enough to sort of cook a whole, whole meal out of it. And you even got the condiments in the back there as well, like the sauces and things like that, which, which I find interesting because I think there's quite a few people that like to make their own barbecue sauces, but you've got that nice base happening that you go like, okay, this is kind of like what you can work with, which is, which is great. Um, and for me, I really also want to try the, uh, what was it the, uh, the yard brick? chicken was it the brick chicken it was like a yeah. like a chicken yard with bird. a brick on it yeah. yard bird yeah that's uh that I, I color a brick and foil chuck it in the bar barbecue i just uh sounds like just an interesting it works, it, works. Yeah. It, it gets you that nice like crispy skin yeah yeah it's, it's great um it's a great little trick so just don't like knock a wall down just to get a brick that's probably not worth it i got no bricks <laughs> in my wall <laughs> <yet>. <laughs> Jenga. <laughs> now, I, but, uh, I heard on another uh, podcast, I don't know if it's, a, if it's true or not, but you mentioned an S&P MSG. Now, I quite enjoy MSG from all the beautiful meat that I eat at all these um, barbecue events where these guys cook up stuff. So I'm not afraid of MSG. I think it tastes quite nice. Uh, is, is, that, is that true or is that just a, a throwaway comment that you said? That I've got three samples of it sitting in my kitchen oh, right now. I like a sample <laughs> <laughs> so, gotta buy it dude <laughs> it it. um so the more i got into meat science and just an understanding of food it was just like 
So it was one of those things where I never personally had a problem with MSG, but when I went to do the, when I went to make hardcore carnivore, it just wasn't an ingredient that I included. I didn't purposefully exclude it, exclude it. I just didn't use it. Yeah. But then when it came time to do the labeling, there's sort of an auto thing that goes off in your head when it comes to marketing. Oh, gluten free. Oh, MSG free. And yeah. that's something that people look for. So it's useful to label it thusly. And we started to do all that and put it out. And then now. I have a jar of MSG in my kitchen mm. and often I will add it to foods or add it to dishes that I'm making because that is what sends things over the edge. Yeah. Um, yeah. The problem is, are you using it judiciously? So most barbecue competitions are not, and then it develops this very specific flavor, even though it's not a flavor. So MSG is just a flavor enhancer. It's a glutamate that's based on, um, uh, naturally occurring glutamate proteins, right? It's just a distilled version of it, like nitrate salt. It still occurs in nature. We've just distilled it down. Yeah. So if you use too much of it, it has a very specific flavor or it, it creates a very specific flavor reaction because what it effectively does is, did you ever see that movie with Bradley Cooper where he takes those pills and like can see through space and time? No. Limitless or something like that? Oh, yes, I've seen that, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's what MSG does for your taste buds, right? It unlocks their full yeah. 100% of my brain being used, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so oh, I think I remember, I think I have seen that now. Um, and there are some people who report a sensitivity to it, but it's not ever been enough or definitive enough to actually be studied because no one has it enough, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I, you know, the reality is a lot of great kind of seasoning salts have it in, um, and I'm kind of just toying with the idea of putting out a product that has it for those of people who like it, who who want to cook with it. So instead of just an SPG, again, you know, Ram, we talked about like burnt end sauce is not just another sauce. Um, instead of just another salt, pepper, garlic, why not do something a bit more fun? Yeah, salt and pepper on steroids. I like it. Uh, just. <laughs> The flavor of dancing. I now, should just uh, call it Roid Rage, right? Yeah. Good <laughs> name. Oh, yeah. Because you'll, you'll, yeah, once you eat it, you're going to want more and more and more and more. <laughs> uh, look, and look, I like that. I like the, I like the, um, like you said, pushing the, pushing the boundaries a little bit, but also, yeah, point of difference, which, which is because, yeah, there's so many SBGs out there, right? Like, and uh, it comes down to granules of salt and the differences are so minute. Um, Hardcore Carnival, Jess Piles, you know, you, you've got you got these two uh, two I guess brands out there, and you, especially with the Jess Piles brand, you tend to, you hardest working. I've seen like you create content constantly. Uh, I think you did three turkeys already, which is uh, which is great. That's a lot of turkey to eat in October. Uh, talk talk us through a week of your life, you know, like you know, I'm, uh, you know, like as in away from doing, you know, you obviously do things like the butcher challenge and you're doing re filming TV series and things like that. But when you from a content life point of view, because I think people kind of go like, oh, it's 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 easy, but I feel like it's a lot of work, uh, especially the meat science, which we'll kick into shortly. But especially the meat science things, I having to like, you know, debunk things. But yeah, like creating content, what's uh, what's that life like? Um, for you, I suppose. <laughs> you have to understand as well, like I've been doing this like content creating for over 10 years. That's a long time to be yeah. doing that. Yeah. And one of the things that I find most challenging is you feel like once you've done it once, you can't do it again. But really, I could film the yeah. same video. And that's what some creators who have really cottoned on to growth have figured out. They just cook a steak every week. And it's just like showing you searing a steak every week. And that's that. And it's funny that you mentioned that one-sided seasoning. Like, that's one of my biggest pet peeves. Um, I think it's Adam. the worst. Like, <laughs> I don't know why you would load up one side over season and not season the other. That's just me. That's how I would cook, you know. And I feel like if you went to a restaurant and they did that, you'd be like, what are you doing? But it looks yep. good on Instagram. So there's also a lot of stuff that happens where we don't necessarily want to eat it, like all these meat pizzas that people are making now, where it's like, that's the last thing I would do to a tomahawk. But it was fun to watch on the internet, you know? Yeah. So, it, it, go ahead. 
I was going to say, it, it's amazing how it's it's become a world of like, what's the thing, what, what's going to get someone's attention and what's, someone, what's going to get someone's attention in the first two seconds. You've got yeah. two seconds to get someone's attention to watch your video. Yeah. And, and when I, I mean, we weren't even doing videos when I started, you know, yeah. and let alone quick videos. And then it had to be that you had to have a full camera set up. And then it was like, no, iPhones and pixels are okay again. And all this kind of stuff. So, um, there's it, it it's challenging on a weekly basis i guess like you know there's work that i do at hardcore carnival and there's work that i do as jess priles and a lot of it is unglamorous emails like i sit here with just out of shot is like a big planner and a million post-it notes with like remember remember and yeah. i constantly also have to think of you know, ideas that are functional. I don't do those videos that are like, I'm going to glue this to this and see what happens. Because that's just <laughs> not the type of stuff that I personally create. Um, and I'd like to contribute things that are more useful than just like entertainment, if that makes sense. So I, I keep a note of, of different ideas and I try and workshop that with both recipes and um, myths, myth, myth busting and things like that. Um, and that has become a new, you know, it's a constant evolution. Like TikTok is yeah. really new that, that forced reels to happen, which forced YouTube shorts and yeah. you kind of have to evolve or die. Uh, and I think that's the thing, isn't it? You can't sort of sit and go like, I just do photos and, and then go like, why am I getting reach, um, scenario, but, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. And I think, you know, what I find interesting uh, recently for you is that you, you brought in the air fryer, right? Which, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I love my air fryer. Uh, but then you're doing air fryer recipes, right? Like, you know, that's that's a whole, that gives you a whole bunch of content, which 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 is great. Uh, from a, so I look at it from a content point of view, I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Like, you can start to do things. But you do pork, uh, the pork little chips you did in the air, pork skin chips in the air fryer. Like, those looked amazing with the meat gelada on it. That's just... But yeah, is you know, do you sort of go like, uh, how much how much negativity do you get when your air fryer comes into one of your posts, uh, or not never. much at all? Because never, perfect. <laughs> um, because everyone has an air fryer now. It seems yeah, like everyone's looking for recipes. But the big, I mean, honestly, like I made a definitive decision to move away from just being pigeonholed with barbecue many many yep. years ago. It for me, it's about a love of meat. You know, there are people who love sous vide there are people who love air frying, there are people who love barbecuing, there are people who love grilling. I think that you should be open to all of the methods that work for you as yeah. long as, the, you know, you're still being carnivore, a hardcore carnivore at the end <laughs> of the day. So I like to keep my options open because even, you know, it even gets to the stage where like, oh, look at this smoked dessert. And there's some stuff that I make just because I know people want to see how to make something on their grill. But, like, I personally, for example, don't like smoked steak. I love grilled steak, but I just don't love smoked steak that's then seared. Um, so I'll do it to the point where, like, I'll at least have a recipe that people can reference. But I don't think that everything needs to be barbecued. Yeah. No, I agree. And sometimes, practically, it's ridiculous to barbecue something uh, or to use a barbecue for it um, just for content's sake um, or for practical just day-to-day -day cooking, really. Right. When you got to, especially on a gas in the house, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, like the, the weirdest one to me is like, I see people doing side dishes where they like open a can of baked beans and then add sauce from a jar and then add something like, it's just all prepackaged stuff. And then it'll put it yep. on the pellet grill. Yep. To eat. And it's like, well, how much smoke can it really take on in the 20 minutes that it's going to take to heat up? <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Totally agree. But so Jess, um, we sort of touched on a little bit, but what drew you into the meat science space? That's a good question, Mark. I had learned a little bit about meat science, like aspects of meat science along the way. So as you get, as you sort of go down this path and you're learning more about butchery, you're learning more about cuts or how to cook or whatever, you start picking bits and pieces up. And Demi Lolbach, who's on the ABA now. And so I sort of dragged, as well. dragged her into this world and she dragged me into the world of meat science because she she studied that. Um, yep. She, in her day job, works for MLA. And she would sort of sneak me different like pamphlets. I've still got a little folder here of all of these little 
um, <laughs> outs and things like that. And I was just fascinated. A lot of the stuff that I went to, she's like, oh, you've got to go to this conference called the Reciprocal Meat Conference from the American Meat Association, uh, Meat Science Association. You'll love it. It's great. And I would go and meet meat scientists. She's like, wait, what do you mean? There's a meat scientist and you can do this? And I would find myself like connecting with more and more people, you know, doing brisket camp at Texas A&M, which is their meat science department, which is a very prestigious university over here. And I would try and figure out, you know, wait, what else affects tenderness? You know, it starts with, with things that we do in our kitchen, like what's, what's in that vacuum seal bag? What is that liquid? Um, yeah. And I just found myself having more and more questions and seeking more and more answers to the point where I ended up going back to school myself. So, yeah, my, my sort of science course lacked a lot of bacon. You all seem to have the right amount of bacon in the course. <laughs> That's what you look for, really. I know. So yeah. I think I picked well, there's no bacon though. semester? <laughs> That was my final research project. And I love watching the research project as well, just sort of seeing the, the methods you went through and how you tested and, and what, what made you come up with the idea of to do that as that your final report? So I really wanted to bring together my, my online life and the meat science aspect of it because I had to apply for special permission to get into this course because I had a humanities yeah, right. background, not a science prerequisite. So I sort of demonstrated to them what I've learned as an adult yeah. um, as qualification and um it was really interesting because i there was a video that went viral on tiktok about adding water to bacon to cook it and i thought you know and every, everyone's an expert on the internet especially tiktok right and oh yeah to their qualifications <laughs> or like wear a stethoscope if they're doctors you, you should still probably double check that so um i thought wouldn't it be cool to address this and do an actual lab sensory analysis experiment on if it works, but also why it works, because it's not merely the reasons you can have a hypothesis, but that doesn't mean that it's the proof. So you yeah. might think, oh, well, it works because when you add water to the pan, it's creating a stable, even heating environment so that the fat can render. But what you're not taking into consideration is the cure of the bacon is set to attract moisture. So is it actually attracting more of that water into it, which helps make it um, more of a tender crisp than a than a overcooked lean crisp? Like what what is actually doing that? Not what do I think is doing that? And that's where it came from. That's unreal, and yeah, it's nice that you take bacon so seriously because uh, yeah, it's it's such a great part of life. <laughs> Don't you not bacon? Oh mate, oh mate, oh you know I, I you know I sort of I love curing, but like doing the bacon thing and making bacon and putting flavors into bacon. But then you taking cooking bacon to a whole nother level, Jess. It's it's to, like, to be fair, you've made the best bacon I've ever eaten around. So to be fair, oh, thank you, thank Aww. you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, you Mark says that because he wants more bacon. Um, I've got to make more, but uh, I do have a, uh, you know, I guess, you know, just because we're sort of running out of time a little bit, I do have a uh, myth, myth I'd love to hopefully get across you and see what you think. This is actually a couple of mates of mine that I, I popped in the other day. I'll, I'll say the story. But so I've gone in and I'm like, hey, guys, here, have some uh, pool beef uh, uh, that I've made up and just, you know, and when he goes, I was like, oh, was it frozen before you cooked it? And I go, uh, yeah, it was frozen. And then he, he sort of, he goes from putting it into the freezer to back into the fridge. Cause so their theory, and I, again, I haven't really Googled this cause I just want to ask you and it'd be that naive question, which, which, which I, I didn't think I'd have a question for you, but their theory is like a frozen meat that's cooked should not be frozen again. Uh, no. for, re for reasons, I don't know, it should be consumed within the one or two days rather than refrozen and then defrosted and cooked again. So, and, and their concern, uh, their concern is pre pre presumptuously um, a safety. The meat, I think right? safety, meat going, meat going off or funny sort of thing and just not being, not being good to eat. Okay. So to answer your question, there's two aspects to freezing meat, food safety and food quality. From a safety point of view, you can freeze and refreeze, refreeze meat as many times as you want to, whether it's cooked or whether it's frozen, freeze, defrost, freeze, defrost. The only caveat to that is you cannot let it get above um, for, uh, above uh, fridge temp, so 4 degrees Celsius, I guess, is a fridge. Um, yep. 
if you if you defrost it and let it get to room temp and then try and freeze it again, you you potentially let bacteria start to form yep. and then it's just going to have be dormant. So now you've got a food safety issue. Yeah. But as long as you're going just fridge to freezer, fridge to freezer, you can do that as long as you want. There's only two. Th there's only one thing that can happen that's potentially bad, which is if there's a hole in the packaging, you could potentially get freezer burn, which again is not a food safety issue. It's a food quality issue. So yeah. the area of the meat that's freezer burned is going to be a little bit dry. It's effectively dehydration. Um, it's going to be off colored. It's going to have oxidative rancidity. So it's going to have that brown color it might smell a little bit but it's not going to harm you it's just not going to taste very good and it's never really going to rehydrate from a food so from from a quality perspective as well every time you freeze and refreeze you form ice crystals in the meat and every time you defrost those ice crystals can rupture and that affects the water holding capacity or in simpler terms how juicy the meat is especially for whole muscles like steak so mm -hmm. there's Research that shows us that the faster we freeze steaks, so blast freezing, the ice crystals form much smaller and you have much less rupturing and much less disturbance to that water holding capacity. Um, we also know that from a quality perspective, it's actually best to defrost as fast as possible. But from a safety perspective, we tell people to put it in the freezer, in the fridge and do it really slowly because you're less likely to get sick that way. No, it's awesome. And I, I guess their concern was the food was cooked and then frozen. Yeah, so well, was, tell them I told them that they were wrong. <laughs> uh, can that's I all I wanted to get. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, now uh, look, you, uh, I've followed your steak uh, methods, for, especially the reverse searing and, and the JKF uh, multiple times, and uh, they sort of both bulletproof. Just yesterday, I had somebody come in and go, hey, mate, I've got a tomahawk, how should I cook it? And I'm like, give me a second, and I literally just sent them a link from your website because it's just so much, well, so much easier than me. Like, well, first you got to, you know, reverse it. You know, uh, so, uh, look, talk us through uh, the two methods. Uh, just, I mean, we haven't got a lot of time, but I, I think JKF seems to be your – you, le you seem to be leaning more and more towards that, but maybe run us through JK, uh, JKF or just keep flipping for uh, we're not talking yeah. about JFK, we're talking about JKF. It's uh, all right. Just keep Everyone flipping. <laughs> so, the idea of reverse sear, which has become really, really popular, especially for people starting to get into like pretty intense meat cookery, because it works every time. It's like training wheels, right? So, the yep. idea for that is that you cook the meat low to start with and then finish with a high sear. So, the low can be smoking, low oven, uh, sous vide, and the high sear can be cast iron skillet, hot grill, uh, blow torch, anything that's that low and high and you rest in between. So the benefits yeah. are it's very precise, you're very unlikely to overcook it, it works nearly every time, and you've already rested the meat before you sear it so it's ready to eat straight away. The yeah. problem is it takes forever. So a, a, a inch and a half, I don't even know what that is in centimetres anymore, let's say two and a oh, half. That, that much? Three? Let's just say about that much. That's a lot. That's about four. yeah. Three to four. That's <laughs> three to four centimeter steak, right? Yeah. So, hang on. I've got, I've got my Channel Nine News. Uh, oh, nice. Had since I was a kid that has both inches and centimeters on it. Um, <laughs> that's one of my great references. So let's say three to four, three to four centimeter steak. Yeah. That in reverse sear would take about an hour. Just keep flipping mm. is the idea that as long as you have a very hot grill or a very hot pan, you should keep the meat flipping constantly. You will both build a crust and not overcook it on any one side, and you can do it in like 15 minutes. So it's wonderful for impatient people like myself. So I started cooking a reverse sear, and then I found myself naturally doing this flipping process, um, and it worked, and it was quick, and it was satisfying because you got to eat sooner, which is wonderful, and you develop a really aggressive crust as well, which is what I want. So I don't like those grill marks that you see in all those, like, Hog's Breath Cafe ads, for example, um, because that grill area, those are flavor compounds that are being developed. So it's the Maillard reaction. It's a crust. So you can either have small grill lines of additional flavor or an entire crust, and I'm in the yeah. entire crust. Mm. There you go. You heard it here. Well, you probably heard it quite a few times on your social media too. Um, I love the fact that caramelized crust or aggressive crust actually has a, a, a term, the, the mallard reaction. That's 
I've, I've heard you explain it a few times and for me i'm like man like i just thought it was a crust but then there's actually like an actual reaction an actual explanation for it which which is really cool to hear as well it's the reducing it's an enzymatic reaction of reducing amino acids and sugars and it's also what makes bread smell really really good you know when it's mm. baking so yeah yeah nice love it and when you're cooking that steak do you know butter or tallow what, what do you think's better so I don't add butter to my steak. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, if I could choose, I would always grill it, and I would grill it over charcoal. So I'm not going to add yeah. either of those to it because it's just going to drip down and cause flare up and burn, and it has natural tallow in it that's melting. Um, I would always use, if you're looking for the panacea tallow, butter is 80% water. Yep. Water prevents the Maillard reaction. So... If you have your pan hot enough and you see a lot of people on, you know, and this is all shit that I learned the hard way. I'm not even kidding you. This is like, oh, yeah, butter makes steak great. And then you go, why is this steak not good? It's just like melted the crust. Yeah. So yeah. unless you're getting that serious foaming that's happening, which is basically the water cooking off in the butter fat, which then yeah. allows it to be more like a fat searing, it can actually ruin the crust of a steak. Yeah. So I love suggesting to people to make a compound butter, which is basically a butter flavored with whatever you want, and add it to the steak after it's finished cooking um, is your best bet. No, easy. That was uh, – I must admit, I um, I do – I agree with you. I like popping the, popping on the grill. It's just um, something of flames coming out, especially when it's like lump charcoal or something and it just looks epic. Uh, great for content. Uh, not that I've, I use <laughs> – too many times. Um, <laughs> ultimately, like, yeah, if you've got flames on a, on a steak, that gets like the pretty good likes. Uh, Jeff, you probably know. Uh, Jeff, Jess, rather, you probably know that. Uh, now, we're running out of time with you and really love having a chat to you, obviously. And we could probably, like I said before, we could probably have five different episodes and talk about one topic and still have an hour worth of show. So, But what's what's coming up next uh, for Jess Pryles and Heiko Carnival? What can we look forward to? And, and uh, you know, will we see you possibly in, in Australia, I suppose? Uh, we, well, I mean, we just released Burnt End Sauce, so that's going to be a thing. Yeah, can't wait to try that. I'm excited for everyone to try that. And, uh, you know, just a lot of travel coming up and always sort of back and forth here and there. I'm in California next week and then it's hunting season here and mm -hmm. all, all this kind of stuff. Um, but I am hoping to be back in Australia next year. I think I'm going to be back for meat stock of Melbourne. So. Oh. Shit. Home, home turf. Yeah, yeah, that's gonna be home amazing. Turf. Yeah, yeah, because I, I remember you, you you came down in between all the craziness, and it was a quick like see your parents and then fly back scenario. Oh, yeah. Didn't sort of have time to do anything or nothing was happening anyway. But no, that's so was cool. Surge at that time, so yeah, we had yeah. The best intentions, and then there was another lockdown or something. Yeah. So. Oh, that's right. You had a class or something set up too with the Q Club, I believe, and that didn't yeah, work. Yeah, we'll probably do another uh, event at the Q Club as well while I'm yeah. there. I'll keep an eye out for that too. Yeah, hundred percent. So it's, yeah, check out the Q Club for any classes. Obviously, Midstock Melbourne, which Mark and I will be there as well. So looking forward to that. Um, now you inspire thousands and thousands of people out there, and obviously uh, more than more than inspire, you educate, which is amazing. So huge thanks. Thank you for that because I don't know, Mark and I would sort of spend, you can spend hours and just flick through your, your reels and your stories and things like that and just learn so much and, and, and get things out of it. And you're doing a, a great deed and great, great work in educating everyone. Um, I guess we ask everyone this on the show is, is, you know, who sort of inspires you and who, who, um, who sort of give, you know, who would you like to give a shout out to that, you know, sort of goes like, man, like what they're doing is, is just amazing and you got to go check them out. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. That's very, very kind to say and it means a lot. Um, this is going to sound a little bit uh, typical, but even even more in in the current climate of influencers and instant experts and people getting a lot of attention just by you know searing a steak, and that's fine. Um, but I think we're losing sight of like a lot of real talent out there for you know just just the entertainment factor. Um, and two people that I really admire who I've gotten to work really close with, in fact, I'll be with in California next year, next week. Um, that person is Chris Lilly um, of Big Bob Gibson Barbecue. He's won Memphis in May a bunch of times. But what people don't realize about Chris is, and especially if you can pick up his cookbooks, he is an amazing chef. He recipe tests things in his personal kitchen. He's got a, recipe, a test kitchen in his house. He recipe tests things like 
crazy. He doesn't just put something out there. He makes sure that the flavors work. Um, and he knows how to write a recipe. Like if you read them, his flavor pairings are beautiful. And I don't think he gets enough credit for that because people just see him as like world championship barbecue pro slowly. But yeah. like he does these amazing blackberry jalapeno ribs and, you know, great, great food. And then the other is the guy who, Hardcore Carnivore, the US edition, has a foreword by Tuffy Stone. And Tuffy is also first and foremost a trained chef. Yeah. And he's one of the nicest people you ever meet. I know a lot of Australians know him and um, have met him. He is exceptionally talented with his food. And his food also, it's that other dynamic. It's not just an American cheese and nachos and queso. And now I'm going to put jalapenos on it. Like it's very, that sounds great. Don't get me wrong, but it's also really impressive to be able to move beyond that. Um, yeah. Both of those men do. So not only are they accomplished at competition and barbecue, but they're just incredible cooks and humans. They're both like unbelievably successful and unbelievably humble. And I think it says a lot also about where we're at right now that both of them also have a pretty low social media profile. And they've done more and cooked more than so much more of any of us. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's uh, look. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I totally agree. And I think that you know there are people out there that even even in the in the barbecue cooking scene that just do so much work, but they're just obviously they're so focused on their passion and getting you know serving up people or doing you know creating recipes and things like that but the the social media just doesn't allow space for them which which is which is sad um and yeah look we met tuffy stone uh at in mm -hmm. in Toowoomba this year and yeah just the nicest nicest person i've ever met the, the most well. polite person i have ever met like it's just it's amazing but yeah look yeah definitely i'll, I'll tag him in the in in on the social there as well as give him a shout out but thank you so much jess uh huge shout out to you and uh Thanks, we will dude. continue to uh can't, yeah, can't wait for the burn in sauce but yeah we'll can't wait to keep uh, yeah like i said your steak cooking method uh bulletproof works every time thank um you. so try that out guys uh i have popped in the in the chat a uh, way to check out your barbecue uh, barbie quest website so we can actually watch it through uh the i think it's like the meat loving texans.com yeah mid -love, yeah so i came I, I wasn't expecting to watch it and then i'm like yeah. Oh shit, it's working. All right, we'll watch it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, looking forward to what comes up next and and, and uh, hopefully seeing you, well, definitely seeing you in Melbourne uh, yeah. at Meatstock, which is gonna be so amazing. good. Yeah, thank you to you. Thanks to everyone who's left a comment in the chat. I have been reading them all, so thank you for being involved. Um, thank you so much for the kind words and also just continuing to promote barbecue and meat in Australia. You guys are doing amazing stuff. All right, thanks so much, thanks. Jess. We'll just, uh, we'll catch you soon. See you guys. There. All right, everyone. That was Jess Pryles, uh live from uh, Texas. Um, so great time on the show and get insight. Uh, as we sort of said, we probably could have spoken to her about one topic for an hour. Today. Yeah, that's it. And uh, <laughs> we try to cram in as much as we can. Uh, so yeah, hopefully we covered a few things off. And can't wait to see her. She's going to be in Midstock, Melbourne. Uh, Mark, how's that beer going, mate? It's going pretty good. So the, I think the one main thing that just gave you all free passes, you can now use your air fryer and all your posts. So that's great. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and on top of that, uh, um, what was the other thing I was going to say? It was, yeah, I can probably have a chat to uh, a couple of mates who don't like to refreeze cooked <laughs> meat that was frozen. So um, that one I'm really excited about. Actually. <laughs> I, was, I was waiting for that one. So, uh, mate, who's on the show next week? Uh, we got uh, Sam Burke from Meat. Uh, meet livestock australia yeah i'm too many beers too early <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's gonna be a rough rough uh, afternoon of work for you yeah. uh yeah so sam burke from meat and livestock australia coming on uh can't wait to have a chat to him he's the the head chef there and he's sort of uh one of the uh i guess product developer or the brand development management there as well so i'm probably getting the title wrong but yeah, he's coming on next week uh next thursday evening can't wait to have a chat to him uh about me love Psych australia because they're doing amazing stuff uh in, in australia to sort of promote red meat uh which is going to be great mate and just uh mate we've got to ask the question what's uh who who sort of um who do you want to recommend who sort of inspires you mate so if you haven't checked him out, I'm sure you would have already, but uh, Lawsy, so Butcher Lawsy, Brett Lawsy, they've, they've got this sort of new book that's come out as well. You know, oh, you got a copy! I got a copy. Get out! So, so get yourself a copy. Uh, uh, mine's still fresh, unlike I haven't got all my 
tag pages yet, but <laughs> copy. Yeah, excellent. So go go no, to the amazing. shop, pick yourself up a copy. <laughs> yeah, mate, I got to give a shout out to Shan Walker too. All things, mate. Uh, he's uh, yeah, same thing. Sort of part of uh, that that book and part of the the management of the the butcher butcher challenge team as well. Going to going yeah. to Sacramento, so go check him out. We'll give him a tag. Everyone have a great well, Thursday uh, wherever you are, and we will catch you next week uh, at eight pm. Right. Talk soon. <laughs>